you would take your Bibles and turn in them to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at the end of Genesis chapter 11 and go into Genesis chapter 12. We're looking at a very important Old Testament text today. And um, something about the Bible, wherever we look, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, the Bible is first and foremost a book about God. It tells us who God is. It tells us what God does. And really importantly for the text we're looking at today, it tells us what God cares about. And that's really important for us because as creatures who are created by God for the purposes of God, who God is, what God does, what God cares about directly affects who we are what we ought to do, and what we ought ourselves to care about. And what I want you to see in this passage today is something about God that is evident throughout Scripture. It's all over the place in Scripture, but I want to go all the way to the beginning here, one of these earliest stories of the Bible, to show you this is who God has always been. This is what He has always done, and this is what He has always cared about. So this text comes... After the flood of Noah, the flood of Noah kind of has a creation reset in it, but it's not long after the flood of Noah that we find that humanity is still sinful, still fallen, still broken, and uh, God scatters humanity out, uh, and in their sin they cover the world and they multiply into many, many nations. And then here at the end of chapter 11, you start to see the story of Genesis focus in on one family out of the nations of the world. So we're going to read in Genesis 11, starting in verse 27. It says, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Izcah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Every year around Christmas time, Southern Baptists take up what is called the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We do it here with our walk to the manger. And this offering, the special thing about it is that 100% of that offering goes to supporting international mission work, to support the ministry to the nations, that people who have never heard the gospel uh, from cultures all around the world would be able to hear the gospel. Since 2016, Southern Baptists have given $1.2 billion to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Now, I'll admit that number sounded a lot better before Pastor Chris's sermon last week, uh, but it's still a very, very impressive number. And that's on top of our cooperative program giving that supports the International Mission Board, which is the largest missions organization in the world with over 3,500 field personnel. This week at the uh, SBC annual meeting, they sent out another 83 missionaries to go and preach the gospel to the nations to people who have never heard. We really care about the nations. 
here at Buck Run last summer, we were able to send a group of 15 high school students to the Balkans where they ministered to an unreached Muslim people group in the Balkans. This September, we're sending another team to go to Panama to serve with IMB missionaries and Buck Run members, Kenny and Cheryl Morris. And in their ministry, they are reaching unreached people groups in, in Central and South America through their ministry. Uh, we are intimately involved with the Romanian American mission where uh, they're doing this incredible church planning work all over Eastern Europe. We have former students who are on the mission field. We have members who are leading missions organizations. Buck Run as a church cares about the nations. But why? What is it that makes us turn our attention towards the nations? There's certainly... Uh, an incredible mission for us here where we are. There are plenty of lost people in Frankfurt. There are plenty of needs in our community. And through things like Reach Frankfurt and Serve Frankfurt and our ministry partners, we definitely seek to engage our community with the gospel. But what is it that would make us go beyond that and say, we are not just concerned about the glory of God here in Frankfurt, but we care about God's glory as it goes to the nations of the world. Why would we do this? Is it just a pet project? Is it Pastor Will likes to travel, so he finds a Christian excuse to get on airplanes and go around the world? Why do we care? I want to show you in this text that we care about international missions. We care about the nations because of something we believe about God. And it's evident in this text, God has always cared about the nations. And because this is what God cares about, the nations should be on your mind. The nations should be on your heart. The nations should change the course of your life and what you live for. We should care about the nations because of what we see about God here in Genesis 11 and 12. It starts at the end of chapter 11. We're introduced to some characters after a couple chapters of genealogies. These genealogies describe the nations from all the families of the earth. Now in Genesis 11, Genesis starts to focus in on this one family, and it gives us the names of real people. They're really difficult to pronounce, and I don't know if I said them right, but they are real people. Terah with his sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and they get married, and nothing else particularly special is said about this family in the end of chapter 11, which is interesting, because if you look all over the book of Genesis, there's some special things said about people. If you back up to Genesis chapter 6, it describes Noah as Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Elsewhere in Genesis 6, it talks about other people that are described as mighty men who were of old. They, these were the men of renown. In Genesis 10, it talks about a guy named Nimrod. He, it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and it goes on and on about all the things that he accomplished. But then we get here to the family of Terah down to Abram. And nothing particularly special is said. It, the details that we get are that one of Abram's brother has a premature death, and then that his wife, Sarai, is barren, which in the context of talking about genealogies in the family of the world means that this genealogy is on life support. This family has little to offer we, uh, we learn from later in, the, in Scripture that this was a pagan family. They were idol worshipers. There's nothing particularly spiritually impressive about this family. There is nothing in this text about the family of Abraham that would tell us that I would thousands of years later be talking about him and his family to a room full of this until Genesis chapter 12. And what do we see at the beginning of Genesis 12? Now the Lord said to Abram. What is the difference between Abram and all of the other names that we can't pronounce in Genesis chapter 11? The Lord spoke. The first thing I want you to see about who God is is something about God's people. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. Grace 
When the Lord speaks to Abram, he is showing unmerited favor to someone who was just another name on the genealogy of pagan nations. He didn't assess Abram's qualifications. He didn't assess his faithfulness. He didn't say he's more faithful, he's more fruitful, he's more fertile. He didn't say anything about any of that. The Lord spoke. God looked at the nations, sinful and separated from him. And out of those nations, he chose a man sinful and separated from him. And he spoke when he could have been silent. The people of Abraham became the people of God because in his grace, God came to an unqualified, unimpressive, unfaithful sinner and said, I will bless you. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. This is evident throughout Scripture. It starts here with Abram set apart because God calls him. But you see throughout Scripture, God shows his grace by revealing himself to people. What happens shortly after this, whenever the descendants of Abram are slaves in Egypt, how does God preserve his descendants? God speaks to Moses. After they're saved from Egypt, how does God uh, make a covenant with the descendants of Abram? God speaks to them from the mountain and gives them the law. How does God set up a kingly line over the descendants of Abram later on? Well, he speaks first to to Samuel, and then he appears to to David and speaks to David and says that the, the throne of your kingdom will last forever. How does God preserve his people, the descendants of Abram, whenever they are unfaithful and they're scattered among the nations? God speaks to them by the prophets. And how is it today that God continues in a New Testament age to call people out of the nations and make them his own? Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But now, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. John 1 tells us that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. God's people have always been defined by God's grace in that God, through grace, calls sinners out of darkness, now through the power of Jesus Christ and the Word made flesh to dwell among us. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. If you are a believer today and would claim to be part of the people of God, there is one explanation for that. God spoke. God made himself known. This was God's doing. It was his grace to look at us sinners, unqualified, unimpressive, unfaithful, and to call us out of darkness. You were just another name on the genealogical list until God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Christians, this is so important because we are not any longer defined by any worldly category or defined by anything in and of ourselves. You are not God's people because he found that you were more deserving, more intelligent, more spiritual, more moral, more powerful, none of that. You are God's people because God in his grace has reached out to you in his grace. Ephesians 2 says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It says, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when you were dead in your trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. So what is the difference between you and the Muslim Malaysian man who prays five times a day to a God who cannot save him. The only difference is the grace of God in the glorious gospel. What is the difference between you and the Buddhist Cambodian who has a spirit house in their front yard thinking that it will protect their family from the evil spirits? It's only the grace of God. What's the difference between you and the atheist in China whose only God is an oppressive government that would stamp out the gospel everywhere it can be found. It's only the grace 
of God in the word of his gospel. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. If you don't know the Lord, if you are not a follower of Jesus, you need to know that wherever you come from, whatever you have done, however good you think you are, or however wicked you may feel, your qualifications or disqualifications are irrelevant. Here is what matters. God has spoken. God has shown himself to us in his son. And his son Jesus came to give his life so that you didn't have to be defined by your sin and defined by the death that you deserve, but that through faith in Jesus, you can instead be defined by the grace of God and be a child of God. Trust in him today. Don't put your hope in yourself, in your own qualifications. Don't put your hope in your own works Turn from your sin and yourself and trust in his gracious call. Hear his call and believe in him. We are defined by his grace. So respond to his grace with the obedience of faith. God calls Abram to go. And then what do we see in verse four at the end of what I read? So Abram went. Abram obeyed the call. Abram believed God. It says elsewhere in Scripture that Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, Abram going is not what saved him here. Abram going is not what made him into the people of God. It was the grace of God that called Abram out. And yet, the going of Abram was a faith-filled response in obedience to the call of God. And the same pattern happens in the lives of Christians. You are defined by God's grace, so your life should be controlled by God's call. When he says go, you believe and you go. When he says speak, you believe and you speak. When he says love, you believe and you love. We have to respond to his grace with believing, with faith-filled obedience. So Abram obeys. He goes. He, and, and Abram looks great in this moment. Obedience and faith is a beautiful thing. The problem is it takes about seven verses for us to get to a story where Abram acts like an idiot. He's, he, he is completely faithless. We, uh, as we went through Genesis with our students in our discipleship groups this semester, and I heard just repeatedly from students, man, I didn't realize how messed up these people are in Genesis. And I always was like, yes, you're, you get it. You understand Genesis because God's people have never been defined by their capacity for faithfulness. God's people have never been defined by their own perfection. God's people have always been defined by God's grace. And that's the reality in our own lives as well. We get glimpses of faith and obedience in our life followed closely by ineptitude and by self-destructive sinfulness. Thankfully, God's grace does not stop at his call. God's people have always been defined by his grace, and God's purposes have always been achieved by God's power. I want you to see something about what God tells Abram here. God says, go, which was a call for Abram to believe and to respond in faith, believe the word of God. And then after that, God gives no other demands to Abram. Instead, what you get through the rest of this passage is a long list of I wills. God makes a long list of promises. He says to Abram, you go, you exercise faith, you believe in me, and then I will show you this land. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. God makes all of these great promises, and none of them rely on the power of Abram. Look, God's plan for Abram was not logical. Abram is an aging man with an aging wife who has never borne him any children. And what God promises is, I'm going to make you into a great nation. 
It doesn't make any sense according to human power. And yet God defines his people with his grace and God commissions his people with his power. And so we must rely on his power for a life of purpose. Too often, I try to determine God's plan for my life based on how I am qualified to help him. But I'm not a child of God because I was qualified. I'm a child of God because of his grace. And I'm not a servant of Christ because I fit the profile of being a usable person. I'm a servant of Christ because he called me out of darkness and said, shine my light back into the darkness. That's what qualifies me. Too often God calls his people to life on mission and we hesitate to obey him because we feel unqualified. But God's call qualifies you to obey. God's call, when, he, when God calls you to reach your coworkers with the gospel, God's power will equip you through faith. Young people, whenever God calls you to reach your fellow students and your classmates with the gospel, as scary as that may seem to you, God's call qualifies you to obey. His power will equip you through faith. If God calls you to go to the other side of the world and to share the gospel with people who have never heard it, as intimidating as that may sound and as ill-equipped as you may feel for that, God's call qualifies you to obey. God's power will equip you with faith. I think about Kenny and Cheryl Morris, who are Buck Run members in Panama with the International Mission Board. When God called them, Kenny was a truck driver who had been a farmer for most of his life. And in 2005, they became convinced that God was calling them to go with the International Mission Board and to take the gospel to the nations. They're not linguistic experts. They're not like super theologically trained ministers or anything like that, but there was one qualification that mattered to them. God had called them to a mission. God had called them, and as they responded in faith, God equipped them for fruitful ministry. We started a garden this year at my house for the first time. I built a a, a raised bed we're just growing some veggies, and it's not that I have like a passion for homegrown produce or anything like that. I, frankly, I am completely content with Kroger supplying my every need. Uh, but I really I wanted to find something productive to do with my boys. I, I I wanted to teach them work and teach them all the lessons that you can learn from gardening and that sort of thing. Not that we're succeeding, but. I mean, there's, there's been hiccups. We started with carrots, which apparently are impossible to grow. Um, but there was a day we, we seeded two rows of carrots and did it together. We took pictures so everyone can know we're farmers now. And it, it quickly became clear that there were shortcomings in my children's gardening acumen. Um, we turned our backs for just a few minutes and then turned around and found Sam in the garden with a shovel just scooping and throwing. And there were, I mean, carrot seeds everywhere. I, I don't know where we planted those carrots. They haven't grown yet. Um, but it was quickly very clear that my boys were not going to do this on their own because as they carefully tilled the soil, they were destroying everything that they were uh, supposed to be doing. I I was out early one morning last week taking care of the garden, tying up plants and just doing things in the garden. And it just occurred to me when I called my boys to start a garden, implicit in that call was my commitment. I will water it. I will protect it. I will fix all of the things that you do to it. (laughs) I will schedule whenever we uh, sow the seed and all of these things. When God calls us to make his glory known, implicit in that call is a host of promises. I will strengthen you. I will keep you. 
I will comfort you. I will equip you. And one of my favorites, I will be with you always. That comes from Matthew 28 when Jesus commissions his disciples to go. And that's, a, that's an important passage to bring up when we look at Genesis 12 because we see a familiar pattern in Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, you have uh, Jesus' disciples have been unfaithful. They have been unqualified. They, they have been defined by their faithlessness. And yet Jesus comes to them and speaks grace. And uh, they, they are no longer defined by their failure, but defined by Jesus' grace. And Jesus reveals a purpose for them. Just like he told Abram to go and he would make him into a great nation, he tells his disciples in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations. But these men who were defined by the grace of Jesus were not called to go out of their own power. Instead, before he sends them, he says, all authority has been given to me. And then after he tells them to go, he says, look, I am with you always. His purposes will be achieved by his power. I just want to pause and acknowledge on Father's Day, this is so important for us as fathers. When I think about the call of being a father to raise children to love the Lord, to disciple children towards life on mission, I am keenly aware of all of my shortcomings. I am so aware of my, my impatience and my fearfulness and my selfishness. But what God calls us to as fathers is not accomplished by our qualifications or by our competencies. God's purpose for you as a father will only be accomplished through God's power at work in you. If God can make Abram, this old Abram, whose wife is barren, if God can make him into the father of nations, do you think God can make you into a father who leads his family to love the nations? God's power at work in us can do it. I, I think so much as a father of three in my 30s, I constantly look back at the impact that my father had on my life. When I think about my dad, I don't think about a perfect man. I am well aware of his shortcomings, of his weaknesses, and his inadequacies. I know all of those things. But you know what stands out to me about the life of my dad? When God called him to go, my dad trusted in God's call and trusted in God to equip him. When God called our family of five to take a one-way ticket to Cambodia to make the gospel known to people who had never heard about Jesus. My dad didn't quibble about his inadequacies or about his weaknesses. He packed up little seven-year-old Will and his two sisters, and he got a one-way ticket to one of the poorest countries in the world for the sake of the glory of God. And that forever impressed upon me the fact that God's purposes will be accomplished by God's power working in those who will rely on him. And I don't think I can give you a more important Father's Day charge than that. You want to have a lasting impact on your children? It's not going to happen because you are the perfect father or because you have all of the competencies that you need to do it. Your children are watching you to see when God calls you to be faithful, when God calls you to a mission, will you trust him? Will you believe in him? Will you rely on him and obey him? Just like God called Abram and said, I will, I will, I will. When he calls us, he includes in that call every promise that we could need to obey him. And there's one more really important connection between Genesis 12 and Matthew 28, and that is the purpose of both of these commissions. Don't miss the end goal. This is not just in Genesis 12 about God blessing this one family, the descendants of Abram. Look at what happens in verse 3. At the end of verse 3, he says, In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's plan has always been global for God's glory. 
there is a biblical context for this that we need to think through carefully. Shortly before this, we have the story of the Tower of Babel. So at the Tower of Babel, uh, there are no nations. All the people of the earth are together. They're speaking the same language. They've got one culture. They've got one goal. There's no mission to the nations because they're all together. And then what happens is in their sin, God scatters them. He confuses their languages and they scatter across the earth and thus the nations of the world are born. Now, then you get all of these genealogies for the next couple of chapters. And then we have this promise to Abram that in you, all the families of the world would be blessed. Now, this is not just some isolated random story to intro us into one family. This is a continuation of the story about the nations. This promise to Abram is the start of God's plan for his global glory in the salvation of the world. The grace that he shows Abram is not just for Abram's sake. It's not just for Abram's family. He makes a promise of blessing for all the families of the world. And you see little glimpses of this promise come to fruition in the Old Testament. You see, by the end of Genesis, you've got this story of Joseph. There's this huge famine all over the world, and Joseph, God puts him in this position to to bless the nations. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 57, it says, All the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. In Abram, all the families of the world are blessed. So there's this little sort of a fulfillment that happens by the end of Genesis. But then what happens next? Joseph dies and everything is bad again. And you see this kind of repeat through the Old Testament in the life of Solomon. Solomon, you have the nations coming to Israel and seeing the wealth of Solomon, but then what happens? The nations become a stumbling block to Solomon and he becomes unfaithful. Later on, whenever God's people are scattered among the nations because of their disobedience, you see them become a blessing to the nations in the lives of people like Daniel. Daniel blesses the nations, and yet that blessing never really lasts more than a few generations. But you still see this promise reiterated over and over in the Old Testament. Micah 4.2 says, Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. Isaiah 45.22 says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And one of my favorites is Isaiah chapter 49 in verse 6. God says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God says it's too light a thing. It's too easy for me to bless one family, for my salvation to be known in one family. That's too easy. No, What is going to happen is my glory will be made known to all the nations because I am a God not just for the people of Abram, but for the nations. God's purpose has always been global for God's glory. But how is that purpose ultimately fulfilled? Because all we see in the Old Testament is temporary faithfulness followed by unfaithfulness. Well, if you go in the New Testament to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul quotes directly from Genesis chapter 12, and he tells us exactly how this comes to fruition. It says, Galatians 3 verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, literally the nations, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abram, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul says in that Genesis 12 is God preaching the gospel to Abram. And what gospel is he preaching? 
that his glory would be made known, that in Jesus, salvation would go to all the nations. Paul's argument is that it has always been central to God's plan of salvation. It has always been central to the gospel that not just one specific kind of person would be saved, but that people from all nations of all types would be saved. This is exactly what Paul goes to in Romans chapter 10. When Romans 10, 13, he says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's saying that God is not looking for a particular sort of person from a particular sort of family or a particular type of culture. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the gospel that is promised all the way back in Genesis 12. All nations will be blessed through Abraham. But then Paul goes on in Romans chapter 10. And he says that even though Jesus has finished his work of salvation and the blessing of Abraham is available to the nations, but he shows us that blessing has not yet reached the nations. In Romans 10, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then what's he go on to say? Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent. The God-ordained means for the global plan of God and His glory is the witness of His people, commissioned to proclaim the good news to the nations. This is why He sends His disciples out and says, Go, make disciples of all nations. This is why in Romans 15, Paul goes on to say, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Why do we give to Lottie Moon every year to support missionaries? Why do we pray that God would send missionaries out of our church? Why do we encourage young people to think on mission and to consider how God would use their lives for the nations? Why do we care about the nations? Because Jesus loved the nations enough to be nailed to a cross, crucified for their sins, crushed for their iniquities, because the heart of God has always cared for the nations. But for Christ to receive the reward of his suffering, the people of God must go. The people of God must realize that God's grace towards us, like Abram, God's grace toward us is not just for us. It's not just for my benefit that God has shown me grace. For Christ to receive the reward of his suffering, fathers must leave, lead their families to live on mission. Young people must orient their lives towards God's global glory. Singles must use their freedom to advance the gospel to the nations. Wealthy believers must use the gifts that God has given them for his purposes. People with influence, leaders must use their influence for God's global glory among the nations. How can the nations call on the name of the Lord? How can the nations receive the blessings of Abraham? It's only by those who will rely on the power of God to preach the gospel to the nations. Someone has to go Someone has to send. Someone has to preach. God's plan has always been global for God's glory. So realize his plan by reaching the nations. God tells us how this thing ends. We don't have to wonder whether or not he's going to get his glory among the nations. If you look in Revelation chapter 7, you see the ending of this. 
Revelation 7, verse 9, John writes, As after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's how this thing ends. Christ will have his reward. A global multitude redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am desperate to see that scene. I'm desperate to stand with the nations who in all of our diversity stand before God and lift our voices, one voice praising the glory of God for all eternity. I desperately want to see that but he hasn't come yet. And that time has not arrived, which means the mission is not complete. Christ has not relieved us of the duty that he has given us. However you measure tribe, tongue, nation, however you look at it, the fact is Christ has not yet come, so our task must not yet be done. God has always cared about the nations, and so should we. We should give ourselves for the reaching of the nations to realize God's glorious plan that his glory would be made known to the ends of the earth. This is not a pet project for those who are passionate about people from other countries. This is God's passion project for human history from his call of Abraham in Genesis 12, all the way to his global multitude in Revelation 7 that will worship him forever and ever. And you have a role to play in God's passion for the nations. Every Christian has a role to play. And it may look very different for different people in this room. It could look a hundred different ways. It might be that something needs to change about your prayer life that you would become a prayer partner for the nations. The International Mission Board has some incredible tools for you to live a life of prayer for the nations. I'd encourage you to look at their website and find those resources. It might be that your prayers need to change. It might be that your pocketbook needs to change. It might be that some of the resources that you have should be directed towards the global glory of God and the reaching of the nations. It might be that your profession should change. I believe that there are people in here that God would call like Kenny and Cheryl Morris to get up and to go and to give themselves for the reaching of the nations. I believe that there could be people in here that God would say there are over 3,000 unreached and unengaged people groups of the world. Go to them. Introduce them to Jesus. I believe there's people in here, God wants to go to the over 3 billion people in this world who could be born, could live their entire life, and could die without ever meeting a Christian to tell them about Jesus. It might be that God would call you to go. Every single Christian has a role in God sending his blessing to the nations because we are defined by his grace. And it is a grace that demands the obedience of faith. And because God's purpose is not accomplished through our qualifications or our power, but God's purpose is accomplished through his power working through us. His plan is for his people to be a blessing that calls the nations into the blessings of Abraham for his glory, whatever your role is. Whatever God calls you to do, we have to go. We have to make disciples of all nations.